Okay. Peace, peace, peace. Let me uh let me do a uh a microphone check real quick. Microphone check, microphone check. I had some issues this morning. Ron Mason, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I don't know if you can hear me. Hold on. Let me hold on, y'all. Let me do my settings. I got I think I got some um Uh. Okay, I had to get my speaker set. Okay, Ryan Mason, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, I was I, I had to reset my speakers. I had a uh, I had completely wiped this computer and had to reinstall everything on it and uh you know just clean it off and that you know all the settings were different so i'm getting all the settings back right but okay you had a question you had your hand up no i do not have my hand up oh, okay I, okay i apologize well you do have your hand no up okay uh all right y'all how's everybody doing this glorious weekend pretty outside real pretty Good, good. Got a good webinar lined up for you today. We're going to get into some negotiable instrument discussion today. I'm um, going to show you all how to put together a bill of exchange. At least I, did, I do it. I originally did it. Um, how it was taught to me. It was actually taught to me this way. It's not, not, not nothing I made up or anything like this. And it actually is going to be like a negotiable instrument you're going to you know see floating around the internet people doing webinars on it and stuff you know i just want to remind people i've been doing negotiable instruments for about 20 years very long time been studying it um longer than actually i've ever been actually involved in this movement and um you know so a lot of uh my expertise comes from that um over the years um uh, you know, Ed, you know, using Adobe Photoshop and different things of that nature. But um, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the law on negotiable instruments. We're going to do an international bill of exchange. And we're going to be coming from the United Nations Conference on International Trade Law. Let me pull that up for you real quick. Hold on for a second. All right. Now, what I want to say about bills of exchanges and promissory notes and a lot of these codes that you see, um, like this one right here, United Nations Convention on International Bills of Exchange and International Promissory Notes, and even the UCC under Article 3, all of them come from something called the law merchant. Okay. I want you all to understand that, that when, when you look at this, you're looking at a codification of uh, rules or uh, that govern uh, interaction between merchants has been going on for over 6,000 years. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, the UCC is not law or anything like that. Well, it was adopted 
uh, it was adopted as a rule for so they can have a unified way of doing commerce. You know, everybody can be doing commerce differently um, on a worldwide scale. And the reason I'm telling you this is you're going to when you start studying the subject, you're going to see there's similarities in all of it. Even when you read Article three, I mean, I remember there was a banker who was showing me all of this stuff. And what he was doing is he was taking the articles out of uh, the Unicentral Convention and comparing it with Article three of the UCC. Um, you know, and, you know, and then that's when I started getting hip to I'm like, oh, it's all the same stuff. They're just taking principles that have been around for a long time and then, uh, you know, just codified, uh, codifying them. And you're going to see this in this. And so what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to uh, let's see if I can split this screen. do it like this it's one of the advantages of having a real big screen you can do all kind of creative stuff i'm going to see if i can split this so we can uh work on one side and do this on the other i'm gonna have to make this smaller all right yeah okay Okay, well, can I? Um, this, uh, show windows stack. Nah, it's gonna stack it like that. I don't want to stack it like that. <laughs> yeah, let me do it like this, but that should be pretty good. All right. <laughs> All right. All right, this should be pretty good. If y'all have a problem seeing anything, let me know. Okay, so I got on this side over here, I got our document that we're going to be looking at, which is the United Nations Convention on International Bills of Exchange and Promissory Notes. Can everybody see okay? You know, raise your hand if you can't see. You know, let me know if uh, you're having a problem seeing anything. Anybody? Uh, Quinn, can you, oh, okay. Ricardo Florimon, can you see okay? I'm good, thank you. All right, okay, good, okay, great. All right, so what we're going to do first of all is, okay, I want you to think about, I want you to put in your mind Office Depot and check paper that you see at Office Depot. Everybody, anybody, anybody ever seen uh, things I'm like Versa check. I don't know if they still sell it at Office Depot or not, um, but they'll have something like uh, check stock. And you'll usually see something like this right here at Office Depot, maybe something like this. And uh, actually, I might be able to uh, uh, take that and save it or let me just see i might just copy it copy image file new yeah something like that right there what is this image size let me see what this size is that's not the actual size though let me see if i can find one of the actual size Uh, anyway, let me do this. I'll make it a, uh, what is it? U.S. paper. Uh, 
All right. Here we go. Let me get this out of the way. All right. But I want you to kind of put this image in your mind of so like some check stock. All right. And um, let me see. I should usually I'm able to at least let me see, save him. I might be able to get this one. Let's see. Just do it like this. All right. I'm just doing it. I'm just kind of doing something quick, real quick for the class. All right. So I want you to put in your mind like some check stock that you get from, you know, like Office Depot or something like that, because this whole thing is what we're going to be going to be creating is going to be based off that. I'm also going to show you another uh, uh, like a uh, a documentary draft uh, international bill of exchange. But we're going to go off of these rules over here to create our international bill of exchange over here. Okay. So I'm going to read it to you. And as we're reading it, I'm going to be making uh, additions over here. Let me pull this up. Let me see if I can, how big I can get this. Get as big as I can so y'all can see it. Okay, I think that's gonna do it. All right. Oh, this over here like this. Okay, yeah, that that'll be cool. All right. All right. So I'm going to read it to you and then we're going to create something. I'm not going to do anything fancy, like put, you know, pictures and things like that in there. You know, I'm just going to keep it real basic and simple for you. All right. Not, not anything fancy. But I'm going to kind of give you an overview of how, you know, you create a negotiable instrument based off the rules. All right. So it says United Nations Convention on International Bills of Exchange and International Promissory Notes. Chapter one, sphere of application and form of the instrument. Article one, this convention applies to an international bill of exchange when it contains the heading International Bill of Exchange, Unicitral, uh, Unicitral Convention, and also contains in its text the words International Bill of Exchange, Unicitral Convention. So right here, this is telling you that it has to have this word right here has to be on here twice on the document. It has to appear in the heading and it has to appear somewhere in the text, somewhere in the body of the document, okay, for it to apply. So if we go over here, click our text tool. All right, you can see we have International Bill of Exchange. All right, I just added that in. Let me, let me make it kind of a little bigger. Okay, that's too big, about 14 points. All right, so we got that. Step one, International Bill of Exchange. We have that in there. Okay, now what you're going to notice is that you're going to always have like two or three uh sections in each article one will talk about bills of exchange the other will talk about promissory notes we're not doing promissory notes promissory notes are two-party instruments bills of exchange are three-party instruments and bills of exchange is what i suggest um, that you use in a secured party process when you're doing secured party okay and i'll explain that to you um a little while i'm not against promissory notes at all uh, but you know, in using a secure party, there's a reason why you study bills of exchange. All right. This convention does not apply to checks. Okay. Even though a bill of exchange is very similar to a check and operates a three-party instrument as well, it's not a check. Okay. So right here we have international it told us it has to be twice in the document. It has to appear in the document twice. All right, so let's make another one. Let's just just for just to have it on here somewhere. 
Let's paste it again. Oops. Oh, my paste. Oh, well, I don't have to paste it again. I can go over here and my settings. Let me get all this stuff out of the way. Let me just, I don't need that. All right, right here, just right click on this and click duplicate layer and click OK. Hit my move tool and just pull down. All right. Also, I'm going to pull out some guides. So I'm going to click on view and I'm going to uh, uh, click on ruler. So my rulers pop up and then I'm going to just pull these down, click up here in the space and pull these down and make them snap in. And then I want something that lets me know where the middle of the document is right there. All right. So now that that will line everything up for me. I got my guides that lines everything up for me. All right, so we got International Bill of Exchange. All right, we have it twice in the document and this was Article 1. Now we're done with Article 1. Let's go to Article 2. An International Bill of Exchange is a bill of exchange which specifies at least two of the following places and indicates that any two so specified are situated in different states. So, it, okay, so you have to have two out of these. There are five different things here. You don't have to have all five. You need at least two of these things on your bill of exchange. A, the place where the bill is drawn. B, the place indicated next to the signature of the drawer. C, the place indicated next to the name of the drawee. D, the place indicated next to the name of the payee and E, the place of payment. So let's read it again. An international bill of exchange is a bill of exchange which specifies at least two of the following places and indicates that any two so specified are situated in different states. Now, we notice we have different states. It has to be in different states. Each of the states of the union are different states. OK, when you look up state in a Black's Law Dictionary, it's going to tell you to see international law. OK, and as a matter of fact, let me let me let me uh, show you all that real quick. Uh, go to your. Let's see, if you go to your reference material. Oh, did somebody erase the, the dictionaries get erased? What happened to the dictionaries, y'all? Did somebody erase the dictionaries? Uh, let's see, what happened to all the dictionaries? Okay. <laughs> Let me uh, see what's going on with the dictionaries. Hold on real quick, y'all. Let me see what's going on with dictionaries. Let me pause this real quick. Okay. Uh... I'm just checking it real quick. Just give me just a second. Just take me a just quick second to see if somebody deleted all this stuff out of here. Um, oh, it's in here. Okay. 
my setting that uploaded to my computer yet. All right. So let me just do it like this. And I'm looking for S. All right. So. All right, I'm back. All right, so we have Black's Law Dictionary up. And I want you to look at this word state. This is an important word for y'all to like really look up to and understand what is a state. What is a state? All right. So right here. State. All right. There we go. State. The political system of a body of people who are politically organized, the system of rules by which jurisdiction and authority are exercised over such a body of people. Now, notice right here this word politically organized. All right. That's why the Supreme Court has something called political do uh, political question doctrine that they will not address. The Supreme Court will not address political questions because this is, you know, this has to do with something else. It had not had to do with the common law or anything like this. But a state is a community of persons living within certain limits of territory under a permanent organization, which aims to secure the prevalence of justice by self-imposed law. The organ of the state by which its relations with other states are managed is the government. A state or political society is an association of human beings. Notice they use the word human beings right here. Established for the attainment of certain ends by certain means. It is the most important of all the various kinds of society in which men unite being indeed the necessary basis and condition of peace, order, and civilization. What then is the difference between this and other forms of association? And what does the state differ from such other societies as a church, a university, a joint stock company, or a trade union? The difference is clearly one of function. The state must be defined by reference to such of its activities and purposes as are essential and characteristic. And as John Solomon, a state is an institution that is to say, it is a system of relations which men establish among themselves as a means of securing certain objects, of which the most fundamental is a system of order within which their activities can be carried on. Modern states are territorial. Their governments exercise control over persons and things within their frontiers. And today, the whole of the habitable world is divided between about 70 of these territorial states. A state should not be confused with the whole community of persons living on its territory. It is only one among a multitude of other institutions, such as churches and corporations, which a community establishes for securing different objects. Though obviously it is one of tremendous importance. Nonetheless, it, it is not, except in the ideology of totalitarianism and all embracing institution, all right? Not something from which or within which all other institutions and associations have their being. Many institutions, example, Roman Catholic Church and many associations, example, federations of employers and other workers, transcend the boundaries of any single state. That was very interesting. That's why I say you should read this. And um, where did I see that where it says, see international law? Um, what was it? International law. I think it was state. Law between states. Yeah, that was it. Let's look at this real quick. Let's go to L. All my uh, Dropbox uh, documents haven't uploaded to my computer yet, so I have to go on the internet and get everything. And uh, and let's look at this next. And I hope y'all are writing these definitions down because they will be on the test. All right, law between states. See it right here? Mm. 
law between states law between states c international law international law and that's something that's very very interesting all right when your law between states is c international law interesting which is why we're using an international bill of exchange because each of the states are like their own country that's why they have their own constitutions and they can form came together and formed a union um that is very important for people to understand because I want you to understand why I'm showing you all this is I want you to understand, well, why are we using an international bill of exchange? I'm sure I'm going to get that question at some point, all right, which is why I took the time to show you the definition of words. You should always look up the definition of words. All right, so we finished Article 1, all right. And now we're going to read Article 2 again, where it says these, we have to have one of these two things. So it's the place where the bill is drawn. The place where the bill is drawn. So let's put on here. Let's go over here and let's look at something. We want to do the place where the bill is drawn. All right. Well, let's do it. Let's get to our type tool over here on the left. We're going to click it. And then we're going to click in the body of our document. And we're going to put drawer. and location all right now you can put um whatever you want under here uh i'm gonna i'm gonna leave this bold and i'm gonna put it over here and i'm going to make it smaller probably want to use about let's see yeah, about eight points, I think would be good. Eight points. All right, so we have drawer location. All right. And now under that, we're going to put what? What do you see on checks? Your information. Now, you may have your own preference how to put, put this. Is Different people put it different ways. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep everything very basic for this. So I would say... John Henry Doe, or you know, and then you can put care of one, two, three, four Main Street, and then this is going to be in the city, state, and zip would be. Let's just put, I'm gonna put your state, your city. And then you're going to put the zip code in brackets. And then you can put on the next one, non-domestic without the United States. And you may have your own way of writing this to show that you're not within the jurisdiction of the United States. And I, I, I'll use a regular font, not a bold. All right. And you see on Adobe, what I like about Adobe, you see the purple line point up, pop up. It automatically lines everything up for you. All right. So that's lined up. All right. So we have our drawer and our location. Okay. It will indicate it right here, steady state, just like you would have on a regular check. All right, so we have the place next, and this is the drawer's information. All right, let's go back to our, our thing. It says place where the bill is drawn, drawer and location, the place indicated next to the signature of the drawer. Okay, so. Let's put a signature line on here because I, I usually try to cover a lot of different bases. So let's add a signature line on here real quick. I kick with type tool and then I will just draw a line. Nothing spectacular. All right. And then under that, oh, what I what I always put on here is I put autograph. Okay. I don't ever put a signature because a real living person has a autograph all 
right so i put my so we're gonna put my autograph on this all right and then i'm going to put under here because you'll see this on you do know on your checks you have authorized representative on your checks in microprint authorized represent anybody ever looked on a on a on a check that you get from the bank and looked at that micro print that is on the check and what it says if you take a magnifying and uh, a magnifying glass and look at it it says authorized representative so right here we're going to put authorized representative under here i'm using about a six point all right and it says the address the place to the uh to the side of it so once again i'm going to take my address over here okay i'm just going to highlight it over here on my layer menu right click it and click duplicate layer again and then i'm going to click my move tool i'm going to take this and move it over here but before i do that i'm going to make it smaller I like to make it very small, maybe even five points. And put that to the side of my signature. Like that. And you can come up with a creative way to do it yourself. Do you have to do it like this? No, you don't have to do it like this. All right. All right. So we're following, once again, we're following the rules over here. The place indicated next to the signature of the drawer. You are the drawer. Here's the drawer and location over here. Drawer and location. So we're the place where the bill is drawn. The place indicated next to the name of the draw E. Okay, now the draw E is uh, the place where you know the funds are going to be taken from. Would be the Secretary of Treasury, or or actually, um, it would be you could indicate it as your straw man, your uh, your trust account. All right, but we'll get we'll get into that in a little bit because I want to. Uh, um, I haven't gotten that place where I've drawn that line yet, but we're gonna draw that in a, in a second. The place indicated next to the name of the payee. Of course, the payee is the person who's going to get the money. So let's do that real quick. Let's put let's put that on here. Let's put pay to the order of. And it has to be payable to bear or to the order of payable to bear or the order of. You'll see that I got a court case that talked about that. But right now we're just gonna put pay pay to the order of because I want y'all to see how to you know create your own instrument. So we okay, so we got pay to the order of, all right. Pay to the order of and you know, I'm going to uh, let's see what I I want to I want to modify this. Um, yeah, let me do this. Get everything looking good. Get the aesthetics on it real nice. And we can make it two lines like that. And let's make it a little smaller, about nine points right here. And then let's make the P on it. Let's hide, let's 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 bold it out up here. Let's bold it. And then let's make the P on it larger than the rest of the letters. So let's just highlight the P. And we're gonna make that P 14 points. All right. There you go. So pay to the order of. All right. Now, of course, we need a uh you know, a line for, you know, 
before you're gonna the we're gonna write in the person's information. So all right. All right, so we got a line right there. Okay, so we have paid to the order of, and outside that person is going to be, this is the payee next to them. Let's say we put United States Treasury. And then next to that, we'll put Washington D.C. All right, so we have, all right, so that should just about cover it, don't we? We have at least two, I, you know, I even covered it more than that. You know, we got an international bill of exchange on here twice, as it instructs us to do. All right, over here in our articles and so forth, let me pull this back over here. All right, the place where the bill is drawn right there. The place indicated next to the signature of the draw E over here. The place indicated next to the name of the draw E, I, uh, which I haven't gotten it at yet. And the place indicated next to the name of the payee right there. And the place of payment. You don't have to have all of these. All you need is two. Sometimes, you know, I'll just put all of them on there just to cover my bases. But you don't have to have all of them. All you need is two. OK, to have the necessary elements for it to fall under this particular convention, these articles and so forth. All right. We're not going to read two because once again, this deals with promissory notes. As I said earlier, you'll see in each of the articles that have one for a bill of exchange, one for a promissory note. OK, and then sometimes it'll talk about a check. All right. Well, let's read what it says right here in three. This convention does not deal with the question of sanctions that may be imposed under interna uh, under national law in cases where an incorrect or false statement has been made on an instrument in respect of a place referred to in paragraph one or two of this article. However, such sanctions shall not affect the validity of the instrument or the application of this convention. What you're going to find out also is this what these negotiable instruments as long as it has that signature on there no matter fraud or whatever does not affect it you know this is you probably heard a lot of people say fraud is permissible in the ucc well that is because of the laws of negotiability of negotiable instruments and giving notice to third parties if somebody receives a negotiable instrument with a signature on it they have no way of knowing if there's fraud attached to it or there's a sanction attached to it or anything like that unless they've been giving advanced notice of that fact or there's some sort of notice that accompanies uh the particular instrument if they haven't they can't be held liable for anything so that doesn't affect it so that is what they're re referencing um when you see things like that you're going to see that a lot too in article three of the ucc as well as in these 96 articles in uh, uh, uh on this convention all right so let's go to article three real quick and read what it says it says a bill of exchange is a written instrument which a contains an unconditional order whereby the drawer directs the draw e to pay a definite sum of money to the payee or to his order okay now you will see some people on their instruments they will put instead of amount they will put the sum certain which is what i like All right, the sum certain. And we'll we'll just kind of like line it up a little bit. <coughs> All 
And then outside of that, we'll put the dollar sign. Anybody know what the dollar sign represents? I'm just kind of curious. You know, it was somebody, uh, they had put out some information that the dollar sign, when it has the two bars in it versus the one bar, uh, that there is a distinction between that. Anybody heard about that? Just kind of curious. If anybody has. All right, let's uh, line that up. All right, so we got paid to the order of, and let's uh, let's extend this out. Actually, I didn't have to make those two separate, those two lines separate, but that's okay. All right, so we have all right the sum certain, all right, and oh, let me go back. Let's look and see. Let's read it again what we're saying. A bill of exchange is a conditional instrument, which I'm sorry, is a written instrument, which contains an unconditional order. All right. So we can put verbiage on it. So let's say there's a word that says unconditional. So let's add something on here. Unconditionally, the sum certain. All right. Unconditionally, order paid to the order of. So, all right, contains an unconditional order whereby the drawer directs the draw e to to pay a definite sum, sum certain, of money to the payee or to his order. All right is payable demand at a definite time, okay? And that's why you'll probably hear some people say at, they call site drafts. So you'll see a lot of times on bill of exchanges, you'll see this word at, all right? Just right there, all right? So let me just add a line for that. And what this at is, You'll see a word site. You hear people call them site drafts and things like that, which have gotten a bad rap because people putting um, rowdy numbers and stuff like that on them. All right. So click right here and you say site. It's paid at site, which, which means as site means that as soon as it is presented, it's payable. Okay. All right. So you say at site. And it's maybe as the David Times, or you can put days after. All right. Days after. Haven't you ever like wrote a check and post dated the check? Where do you think that comes from? All right. And this is what's so beautiful about bills of exchange is you can do things with them. You can make them in a series. You know, a lot of, uh, you can make it where uh, you can just do the payments with the bill of exchange. Very, very versatile um type of uh uh negotiable instrument to use so it's either going to be at site or days after either one of the other you can specify which which uh which one that uh you'll be utilizing so if you're not using days after you can put on here not applicable Make this a little smaller. And I don't want this bolded out. Let me just use regular. And I might, might add a little spice to it. I mean, let me do add some spice to it. Not applicable. All right. Now I'm going to pause here and I'm going to add some things too here um, that. You know, I always like to put on my instruments. It's not a part of the United Nations uh, in the articles. However, I do it because I want to make sure that my instruments always stay in the private. Okay, I don't want any, any be any confusion by anyone who gets my instrument 
and think that it's uh being it's going to be routed through some sort of public um you know venue or something like that so what i always do and this is how you're going to know that they're my bills of exchange i'm the one who did this i'll put private issue i put it on all my instruments oh girl on the internet she doing a webinar on them she just took that instrument and goes ran straight from me i was like golly that's my stuff drella whatever i'm gonna say i'm gonna say what her name is you know i was like wow i saw that video it just tripped me out so i went ahead and did a video on it as well so i took it down but somebody still posted it's still on the internet somebody copied it and uh uploaded it to their website to their you uh, their youtube page so if you look for it on the internet you'll see it use avail creating negotiable instruments all right so right here we have private issue all right and what i'll do is i just usually just duplicate the layer and I got proof that it's mine because I've been making, I got negotiable instruments videos going back five, six years <laughs> of these, of the same instruments. So now nobody can deny it's mine. It's like, look, I got evidence. You know, people been attending my webinars for years. What are you talking about? So, and I'm going to tell you, I always do a little esoteric stuff. I always try to make sure I have seven stars on each side of my private issue. You know, I'm not saying there's any rhyme or reason to it. I'm just superstitious like that. You know, I kind of think the numerology has a lot to do with things. So I'll make sure there's seven stars on each side. All right, so we got private issue, private issue. Okay, and another thing that I add on here, I'm gonna add all my stuff on here while, while I'm at it, is that I add the, uh, regist the routing information up here, which is your registered mail number. Okay, it's your registered mail number. So I'll put up here recorded. Registered funds. And then I will put the registered mail number of the instrument up here. Man, what I just do? Oops, hold on. I just hit something. Now I'm going to talk about this for a second. Because I think this is important. Um, where is it at? Oh, here it is. All right, cool. I always put it in red and I always put it right at the top. And I'm gonna put it in a nice font. Let's make it, yeah, nine points might be cool. All right. All right, now on a check, how you write a check, it has to go to the account number, okay? All right, it has to be on account number, so up here, this is going, what registered mail number is this going to be? Is it going to be the registered mail number you mail it with? Or is it going to be the registered mail number that you sent your original bond with? Okay. So if we're talking about recorded registered funds, okay, with this right here, it, you're registering this instrument. Okay. You're going to have a, a cover letter that goes with this as routing instructions. All right. Is right, you have you always send routing instructions with the instrument, so you don't have to put the routing instructions on the instrument that can go on a separate document. All right, so what I do is I always put the registered mail number that I mail the instrument with because I'm registering this. This is registered when you send it, you're sending a registered mail, they even ask you these funds and, and so forth, like this. So I put it, through, I actually put the registered mail number that it is being mailed with on the particular instrument so it can be tracked. This is like a what? A QSIP number. A QSIP number is Committee on Uniform Securities Identification Process. So you can identify 
the instrument. All right. So that's why I put that on there like that. Okay. So you have a recorded registered funds. All right. And if you want to, you know, just for aesthetic purposes, you can sometimes what I do, because I like to get creative. And I'll just have that part black and that part red. All right. Just make it stand out a little bit. Okay. So now, so, okay. So it's starting to come together. It's starting to look nice. Starting to look real nice. Starting to look like a negotiable instrument. All right. So let's get back to our articles. I right, can finish reading the instructions. We're reading the instructions on how to put this together. All right. So a bill of exchange is a written instrument which contains an unconditional order whereby the drawer directs the drawee to pay a definite sum of money to the payee or to his order or to his order. If it's payable on demand or at a definite time, we got it that at site. That's what all that about is signed by the drawer. We're going to sign it. All right. So we got all that covered. Okay, we have, I haven't put the uh, draw uh, the uh, the draw e on here yet. We're gonna get to that part too. And this is what a promissory note, and that's not that we're not dealing with promissory notes. So now we're at chapter two, interpretation, section one, general provisions, article four, and the interpretation of this convention regard is to be had to its international character and to the need to promote uniformity in its application and the observance of good faith in international transactions. This is all the reason why you adopted the UCC, okay? Also, and remember, everybody's saying that they are foreign to the United States. That's another reason why we're using negotiable instruments, the International Bill of Exchange, because you're saying, I'm foreign to the United States. You keep saying it, hey, I'm foreign to you, okay? So let's go on. Let's look at Article 5. In this convention, a bill means an international bill of exchange governed by this convention. Note means an international promissory note governed by this convention. C, instrument means a bill or a note. Draw E means a person on whom a bill is drawn and who has not accepted it. Okay. Pay E means a per, and this is very important for us to talk about because the United States will say you're trying to draw on them and that's not what you're doing. Your account is a private account. OK, that you're setting up with the Treasury Department It is your account It is not coming from the United States. The Treasury Department is just a holder of a bond for you. OK, it's coming off of that bond. And that is what you need to make. Uh, make sure that you understand in your mind, because that's going to lead you. That's going to keep you out of getting indicted and things like that and keeping it completely private because the United States, they not like to play word games and act. Oh, you act like, oh, we don't have a secret account for you. Okay, well, no, I, I know you don't have a secret account for me. I sent you a bond. That bond is, has a value attached to it, and I want you to deduct from the value of that bond and assign that to other entities and so forth. Doesn't have anything to do with anything that you set up at the Treasury Department or anything like that. It's totally doesn't have anything to do with the United States government, Treasury Department having an account there directly in their uh, with their bank or anything like that. Nothing whatsoever. I want to make that perfectly clear. So if you're an agent, get your ass off the line. You can report back to your boss and say, yeah, we there is nothing here. You report back right now, so there's nothing there. We got to move on. All right, he's not teaching them. He's teaching them the correct way. All right, so we can see right now we got all of this. Looking pretty good, looking good, looking good. We got some more stuff that we're going to add to it in just a second. All right, let me let me get back. All right, now, and we have all of our definitions. Payee means a person in whose favor the drawer directs payment to be made or to whom the uh, maker promises to pay. We all know what a, pay, a payee is, is a person who's getting the money. Holder means a person in possession of an instrument in accordance with Article 15. That's what the Secretary of Treasury is. He is a holder. You are the holder in due course. And the, and the course, as this uh, International Bill of Exchange is negotiated and goes around the obstacle course of commerce, is going to end up back with you. Is You're going to be the in, in holder. All right? You have the authority over it. 
Now they have something really interesting in uh, the international game. You have something called a protected holder. Okay, means a holder who meets the requirements of Article 29. And let's look at these articles while we're talking about it. Okay, holder means a person in possession of an instrument in accordance with Article 15. Let's jump down to Article 15 and read it real quick. What is Article 15? A person is a holder if he is the payee in possession of the instrument, like you do if somebody writes you a check. If somebody writes you a check, you are the payee in possession. Okay, B in possession of an instrument which has been endorsed to him or on which the last endorsement is in blank. In blank means that, hey, anybody can cash it, okay? And on which there appears an uninterrupted series of endorsements, even if any endorsement was forged or was signed by an agent without authority, okay? Then once again, remember what I told you about the, uh, you'll hear people say, well, you know, uh, fraud is permissible in, uh, the UCC. This is one of the reasons why people will say that, but I understand why they have to allow that. It's not really fraud. Okay. Now, um, this is also why people who have said they have gotten their original birth certificate, see there are different signatures on the back. This is also the reason why you hear people say, put a stamp on the back of your instruments because what that's going to do is it prevents, because as when these things get negotiated, different people sign it on the back. Just like if you sign over your check to someone, if you get your, if you get your uh, check from, the, uh, from your job and you want to sign it over to someone, you have to sign it and then they take it, to, you have to sign it over to them and then they have to take it to the bank and then they have to sign it. Well, that's called negotiation. It gets negotiated like that. When we put a stamp on the back of it and you sign through the stamp, that's letting you know you're the last person that has the last negotiation on it. It's been stamped. You'll hear people talk about that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. All right. So we just read this, and in Article 17, I think it was talking about a protected holder. Was that Article 17? We're just reading Article 5 right here. A, protect, a protected holder as Article 29. A protected holder means a holder who meets the requirements of Article 29. So let's see what Article 29 says. Article 29. Protected holder means a holder of an instrument which was complete when he took it or which was incomplete within the meaning of paragraph one of article 12. You got to jump over there and read that. Ours is going to be complete though. And was completed in accordance with authority given, provided that when he became a holder, A, he was without knowledge of a defense against liability on the instrument referred to in paragraph one, A, B, C, E of article 28. B, he was without knowledge of a valid claim to the instrument of any person. Okay, C, he was without knowledge to, of the fact it had been dishonored by non-acceptance or by non-payment. D, the time limit provided by Article 55 for presentment of the instrument for payment had not expired. And E, he did not obtain the instrument by fraud or theft or participate in a fraud or theft concerning it. Now, this is what is called a protected holder. I'm going to open up the mic. I want somebody to tell me what is a protector holder called in Article 3 of the UCC? I'm going to stop right here and give somebody an opportunity to answer this question. What is, I'm going to, wait a minute, let me clear everybody. All right. Raise your hand if you, if you kind of think you know what a protected holder is. Robert Mallet Bay. Oh, man. Please don't call me Mr. Mr. Yusef Bay. You suck your hand up. I know. I tried, hey, I tried to put it, put it, put it down because I'm really listening. I got okay. something else I want to say later in terms of direction that you gave me, but right now I'm just listening. Okay, all right. All right, all right. Ricardo Florimond. My hand's down. Okay, it's down. Nobody want to say? Marti Martin Martinez? Yeah, Nobody let me, uh, <clears throat> I think that the uh, protected holder would possibly be the uh, secured party in the, uh, in the indenture agreement. No, no, that's not what I'm asking. I, right, I'm gonna let, let me go on. Uh, Danny, uh, 
I, I can't pronounce your name. I have a hard I follow. Time. I follow. Okay. Peace <laughs> to the guys. Guy. Peace to the guys, bro. What is a protected holder? And, and um, it seems to me it. like it's yeah. It seems to me like it's similar to a holder, as expressed in the uh, the uh, Article Three. Okay, that's close, but no. All right, let me try somebody else. All right, let's go to Kelly. Uh, what is it, Kelly? Kelly, yeah, you got your hand up, but you ain't got your mic open, baby. You ain't got nothing. Uh, I can't get. In the, I can't get at you. Let's see. We got anybody else? Nobody else. Uh, let me try Michael Walk. Well, no, he didn't. Michael Walker. When well, his hand went down. Steve Cobb, you want to try it, Steve? Would that be a person who's entitled to um, enforce their instrument? As close, but that's not what I'm looking for. Okay, all right. Remember earlier, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna go ahead and tell y'all. Remember earlier, I told you that the banker had me comparing Article Three of the UCC with this. Okay, that is because in the, a protected holder. That's what we're finna compare right now. All right, let's go to UCC 3-302. Holder in due course. Wow, look at that. Holder in due course, man. You know, let's, let, let's look at some things, okay? Let's compare these two. If I can get it up, okay. Let me let's see if we can compare these two. Let's do a comparison, side by side comparison. I want y'all to see where these people get their ideas from, okay? All right, hold her in due course. Subject to subject, and of course they're gonna make it subject to other stuff. The holder, let's go just jump to two. Okay, it says. Holder in due course means the holder of an instrument if the holder took the instrument for value in good faith without notice the instrument is overdue or has been dishonored or has been in an uncured default with respect to the payment of another instrument issued as part of the same series without notice that the instrument contains an unauthorized signature or has been altered without notice of any claim to the instrument described in section 3306 and without notice that any party has a defense or claim in recoupment described in 3305. Let's read protected holder again. Protected holder means the holder of an instrument which was complete when he took it or which was incomplete within the meaning of paragraph one of article 12 and was completed in accordance with authority given provided that he became a holder. A, he was without knowledge of a defense against liability on the instrument referred to in 1A, B, C, and that liability on the instrument right here would be what they saying right here without claim to an instrument, without notice of a claim to the instrument. All right? C, he's without knowledge of a valid claim on the instrument of any person. Right here again, without notice, all right? C, he was without knowledge of the fact that it had been dishonored by non-acceptance. Okay, he took it in good faith. Without notice, the instrument is overdue or has been dishonored. C, are y'all getting it right now? So in, in the UCC, they call it a hold in due course. Over here, they call it a what? They're the same thing, ain't they? This one right here gives more clarity to me. This makes it more, more. This right here lets me, this right, I prefer this word rather than hold a new court. I mean, everybody gets confused with this word. But this word lets you know, when you the, you are the, protect, you protect it. When you're the holder in due course. You're the protected holder. Now they got what's called uh, 10 defenses. And everything. We'll talk about that a little later. Probably put them in here in the articles. I think they're in the articles. But did you did y'all see that? Do y'all see what I'm talking about? I right, well, that banker, he was going through the entire this entire document and comparing it with everything over here. The reason why you see both of them in here is because these are principles that come out of the law merchant. That's what I'm trying to get y'all to see. It's no really appreciable difference in them. They just word everything different and and spice it up, but they all using the same principles. Does everybody see that? We'll make sure everybody sees that. If anybody, if anybody's confusing now, I want to pause. You know, raise your hand if you're confused on what I just said. I saw. You say, "Use." I don't see what the hell you're talking about. Quinn, you got your mic open. Hey, what's up, Yusuf? 
Hey, what's happening, man? What's going on? Oh, ain't too much. Yeah, man, I tried to raise my hand, and uh, I, I, I don't know if my, my mute button is stuck or whatever, but uh, I knew it was holding due course, but... Uh, yeah. Well, I know you know, man. You, you're a van student. I, I You know, I can't let you... <laughs> I can't let you just answer all the questions, man. I can't do it. All right. <laughs> Got to give somebody else an opportunity. <laughs> right, 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 right. Check this out, man. Uh, I finally found that uh, the international bill exchange that uh, that was sent back to me. And uh, now we're from a dealership from a state of Benz of, uh, in Baton Rouge. So the guy kept on calling and saying, uh, I left something that I left. We we put something in the envelope, but we need you to return it. So on the back of it, uh, they stamp uh, 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 Chase Bank stamped on there. They, they got a batch number and they say pay to the order of any bank or any banker prior endorsement guaranteed J, uh, JP Morgan Chase Bank of Houston. Uh, yeah, man called, yeah man, they will they will stamp it. I had one stamp like that. They have right did they have all the routing numbers that they routed it with? Uh I, I, I know that you got a batch number on it. A batch number well that well that's what they process in the batch number. Mine came back, had routing numbers in there, and they wouldn't give me the original. They gave me a copy of it. Yeah, they didn't give they me the original me. back. You kept you on know? calling me for it. Uh -huh. You kept on calling me for it. So I just thought so I just blocked this call. So I said, damn. I wonder if he was calling me, telling me to come get the call. Right. <laughs> Maybe. Hey, let, 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 let me say this real quick. This is what I want y'all to understand. I want you to visualize this in your mind. Okay, first of all, there isn't any money. These documents are not for paying for things. It's like a tax credit that you're using to offset an obligation. Okay, look at it. And, that, and I want you to kind of cast it into those terms because remember, you are exempt from having to pay for anything. OK, everything is already prepaid. You're going to keep hearing this. So these are really instructions. All this instrument is is an instruction of where to direct your credit to. It can take any form. It does not have to look like a check. And that's why I'm going to show you a documentary draft after this. But this is just all this is is an instruction instrument. OK, you're directing someone where to direct your credit that they are holding for you in the form of a bond at the Treasury Department. You're gonna reference that bond when you mail this off. Okay, that is called routing instructions. How do you route this instrument? You're routing the instrument because you're directing them where the credits are located. The credits are located in the possession of the Secretary of Treasury because he is the holder of it and he is the one that has the books. Okay, he has the books of er everything that's going on in the country. He has to have the books because the United States is in debt. They are debtors. Okay, and you are a creditor in the private. Okay, so he, uh, they owe you. They are, everybody says it. I hear people on my YouTube page, it cussed me out. You surveil, you're an agent. They owe us. They owe us. Okay, well, I'm trying to show you how to formally utilize your credit to offset obligations, okay? Don't look at this as some sort of money uh, in that money is a, de a wide definition anyway, but it's credit that we're dealing with and this instrument is directing them how to route the credits, all right? To, to lodge it on books, to offset, okay? This is private credit that you're utilizing, all right? I want people to understand that, all right? Get that in your mind. It is not for purchasing. Uh, when he's referencing an automobile, that's a that is that involves a process where you're getting a um where you're getting a firm offer in the form of a um what is it called, Quentin? A uh, purchase order. You're getting a pur a purchase order is a contract. Once you got that, now there's an obligation and has to be satisfied. There's a debt that's owed. You owe somebody. Matter of fact, I I I, I um what was it two years ago last year I went up in New Jersey and tried to get a uh it was a two hundred thousand dollar Austin Martin it was nice and I'm talking to the finance manager and uh, a guy at Porsche told me this he said look 
a lot of these other dealerships uh, that deal domestically, they don't know about bills of exchange and things like that because they don't deal internationally. He said, you're only really going to have a lot of dealerships who understand this, who deal internationally. It was a guy, Porsche told me this, told, uh, told me this. He said, a lot of these domestic guys, they don't know nothing about bills of exchange and stuff like that. They just want you to write them a check and go to the bank. But people who come in and deal with a lot of international uh, moving uh, you know, cars from Germany and things like that, they would understand this what you're attempting to do, all right? So that's what this is. This is a bill of exchange. It's a credit that is being, and now you have an obligation with the purchase order. And now, but and even that guy at um, the dealership at Austin Martin, he told me, he said, if I give you this purchase order, he said, I can't sell this car. He told me I can't sell this car and they can't sell that car. That's why you put a claim on it. He told me, he said, man, I can't do it. You know, he didn't really want, you know, I was explaining to him what I was trying to do. And he said, he would not give me a purchase order. He said, I can't do it, man. He said, I'll give you that purchase order. I can't sell this car. You got a claim on it. And see, I went to, uh, uh, I think it's in uh, Pennsylvania, I think. I went, I, I, I went got a purchase order for uh, Winnebago. And then Winnebago, like 300 or something thousand. Do you say, uh, uh, you can put a, uh, a security deposit down. So uh, I said, nah, man, uh, just, just go and send it. That man would not send me that. Boy, well, the thing were, about it is uh, a security uh, a security deposit is required, okay, in some form because you have to give consideration for the contract to be binding. You right. can give as much. You can give as much as ten dollars, right. right? You give as much as ten dollars. You know, for it to be for it to be a uh, uh, you know considered to be uh, you know a contract has to have what offer acceptance and consideration. Right. So what you is know, the consideration that you're offering? You know, back then when I got with you, I was just doing shit. Just right. Was doing stuff. Right. See? Well, you know, in the real estate game, if people go and study real estate game, there was these two ladies. They were they were doing seminars where you could purchase real estate for ten dollars, and I did their stuff, and it worked for me. And what I did was, I was dealing with vacant houses, and um, I found a vacant house. Uh, I uh, write down the address, go down to the tax assessor's office. Uh, locate who the owner was, send him a letter, uh, tell him I want to buy it. I had this one guy wanted to buy it. He, he was willing to sell it. And I went to go see him and I negotiated with him. I, you know, I already did a comparative market analysis, a comp on uh, the market. Uh, I did an assessment of it. It needed a new bathroom, kitchen and an HVAC, about $10,000 worth of work. Um, the market at that time for that particular neighborhood, um, uh, the after repair value of the home was about eighty thousand dollars, and I I made him I asked him what he would wanted for it, and he told me uh, forty nine thousand dollars, and I and make it short I I I, I talked him all the way down to thirty eight thousand, okay, and then I got a contract with him and I gave him ten dollars as consideration, okay, wow. went to uh went to the newspaper. Put an ad in the newspaper, handyman special, deep discounts. All the rehabbers started calling me because once I had that contract on it, I own the house. I own right. the house. No, they can't sell the house. It's the same exact thing. What you do with that purchase order? I got y'all. Y'all got to understand what's going on. So once I got that contract, I put that ad in the paper. At about forty-five days, a uh, a a a, uh, 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 a a rehabber came. And bought it from me for forty five thousand dollars, and I was broke. I was I'd been out of jail for the thirty days. I did this in thirty days out of jail, made seven thousand dollars, and never looked back. Not six thousand, sixty five hundred, something like that. What I made, okay. And then I went and uh and I went to closing. I did an assignment of contract. I signed the contract over to him. Went to closing and picked up my check. And y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all in, 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 uh, into uh, real estate, you know what I'm talking about. Well, that same yeah, yeah. thing, that same principle applies in the situation with the automobile when you get the purchase order. You know, it's a contract, but it has to have a firm offer. You know, it has a consideration attached to it. So, yeah, you have to give them some sort of money or something like that to make it make the consideration valid. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, too, which uh, for the, uh, for the listening audience, um, those cars that's at that lot, that is abandoned property. Yeah, they're abandoned property. I, I had an owner tell me that. They're in trust. 
They're put in a trust. The bank has them in a trust. Okay, the dealership doesn't own the cars. Okay, the dealership gets their money from, um, you know, servicing and down payments and things like that. All right. Because, you know, I had to stop and think, well, how do these people got all these cars on this lot and they ain't being sold? Okay, well, they, the dealership don't don't own them. They put in a trust. They're a trustee of the of the vehicles, of the automobiles. And, right. they, and, and they're selling it. That's why they want a down payment and, uh, you know, want you to service the vehicle there and so forth. That's how they make their money. Yep. That's how they make their money. Yep. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you, man, Wes, you know, if, if, if I think it's Tom, uh, Tom of Rooters or whatever. Wes, Wes Legal Farms, if, if your farms can get those books, I recommend. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Those are good books. I, I I have some stuff from some negotiable instrument books uh, around here. Um, it would be very when you read those books. I'll, I'll probably have some of it tomorrow uh, when we do the class tomorrow, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. I made photocopies. I went to the law library, made photocopies, a lot of stuff uh, that shows some people some stuff. Real, real interesting. Uh, right. There's one in there about purchasing as, uh, as uh, also. It's real, yeah. real interesting. Yeah. All right. uh, one more thing. Hey, um, did you ever um uh, check your email that I had put you as a authorized user to uh to utilize that library on? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't got a chance to use it yet, but I did get the email. Um, hey, but I'm gonna check it out. I'm definitely gonna check it out. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You got some counterclaims in there? Uh, uh, no, yeah, uh, counter, yeah, counterclaims that you was, that you say you was working on. Man, they got they in there. Okay. You know. Okay, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right, y'all. Let's get back. Let's get back. All right. Thank you, Quinn. I appreciate it. All right. Well, and, okay. I just want to put that out there and make sure that we're clear on these instruments, their purpose. Um, this is for set off. Let me put this uh let me put this down here. Because I know this is being recorded. So let me uh Let me put this on here so it'll be in y'all's subconscious mind. You know, you just have to keep seeing that, you know, be in your subconscious. You know, you'll be like, you know, ask me a question. I'm like, okay, put this on here. So say so I mean, grain your subconscious mind while I'm doing this for set off purposes only. All right, that's what you're doing. What is a set off? Let's look at the definition of set off real quick. What is a set off? And where is my uh All right, set off. Let's look at this real quick. Set off. A defendant's counter demand, counter demand against the plaintiff arising out of a transaction independent of the plaintiff's claim. All right, this is what counterclaim, set off and counterclaim. Corpus juris secundi, set off and counterclaim, subsection three and six. You should go to law library and read Corpus Juris Secundi. All right. That's a, that is a legal encyclopedia like American jurisprudence. They are some blue light blue books that you will see in the law library. The American jurisprudences are green books. Two, a debtor's right to reduce. Okay, now we're going to get into some explanation. A debtor's right to reduce the amount of a debt 
by sum the creditor owes the debtor, the counterbalancing sum owed by the creditor. Okay, remember, everybody say, well, they owe us. Okay, yes, they do owe you. They owe you the private individual. They do not owe you the public individual. The public individual, everything in the public is a debtor. So this is why it has to be private. Okay, as a private, this is private credit. Okay, they owe you. Okay, so that is what you're doing. You're doing a set off. You're using credit that is being derived from the fact from House Joint Resolution 192, June 5th, 1933, Public Law 73-10 and Title 31-511 AD2, where they have eliminated the gold clause, taking it over to a private jurisdiction where there isn't any money, that the only value that can support uh, an instrument is labor or some sort of interest in property, which your labor is your property, okay? some sort of interest in property, you put in a claim on that interest to your property, a superior claim in the form of filing a UCC-1. Now you are using that value from your claim as credit to be assigned over to set off obligations in the public. Does anybody not understand what I just said? Let's pause right here, because we're talking about negotiable instruments, and this is very important for you to understand. So I'm gonna pause right here and, I'm, well, I'm gonna finish reading this definition and I'm gonna take some questions on this. Now, right here, banks and banking, I right, set off and counterclaim, all right? The balancing of mutual liabilities with respect to a pledged relationship. A pledge is like pawning. Okay, I'm gonna talk about pledge in a little bit too. Set off signifies the subtraction or taking away of one demand from another opposite or cross demand so as to distinguish the smaller demand and reduce the greater by the amount of the lesser. I, what did it say? Reduce the greater by the amount of the lesser. This is also the reason why you file your UCC3s because you are reducing your credit every time you utilize it. That has to be documented and you need to keep track of that. If you have a $100 million bond and you uh, set off a $200,000 obligation, $200,000 is going to be deducted from the $100 million bond. No different than balancing a checkbook. It's your statement of account. Or in the opposite demands are equal to extinguish both. It was also formerly sometimes called stoppage. Because and that's also called a um, a, uh, a compensation. Okay, there's another word for it. It's called compensation. Let me show you this word. Is there any compensation? Hold on, let me just find it. I'm, I'm, oh, you know what? It's probably in Bouvier's. Might not be in this one. Hold on. It might be in Bouvier's. Uh, let's see. I think I had to get that out of Bouvier's. Yeah, it was 1856. Oh, did I pull out the wrong? Oh, I don't think it's finished low. Hold on, let's see. Oh, man. I don't know how this movie is. Um. Uh. 
Uh, let's see. that okay <sighs> right here all right compensation Compensation. Let me see. Did I get all of it? Yes, yeah, no, it's a lot of it. Compensation. Chantry practice. Equity. The performance of that which a court of chancery orders to be done on relieving a party who has broken a condition, which is to place the opposite party in no worse situation than if the condition had not been broken. Courts of equity will not relieve uh, relief from the consequences of a broken condition unless compensation can be made to the opposite party. Uh, and let's see. Right here. Here it is. This is one I want. Compensation. Contracts. Civil law. When two persons are equally indebted to each other, there takes place a compensation between them which extinguishes both debts. Compensation is, therefore, a reciprocal liberation between two persons who are creditors and debtors to each other. Now, how are you creditors and debtors to each other? You're creditors and debtors to each other because in the public, your straw man is a debtor to the United States. In the private, your straw man, uh, well, your straw man is a debtor to you. And the United States is a debtor to you. In the public, you're, you're, you're a debtor. Let me put it in a way you understand. In the public, you would be, through your straw man, a debtor to the United States. And the private, the United States, is a debtor to you. So you're playing a role of both creditor and debtor at the same time because your straw man entity is a debtor. The real living man is a creditor. You are in control of the straw man. So the, the, when the uh, United States drafts something, they are drafting your straw man. Okay. However, you as the third party intervener, the secure party, you are a creditor, okay? So there's compensation, which liberation takes place instead of payment and prevents a cir uh, circuity, which means unnecessary litigation, or maybe more briefly defined as follows. Compensatio es dipity, and you can look that up. All right, compensation takes place, of course, by mere operation of law. Operation of law means it takes place automatically. Even unknown to the debtors, the two debts are reciprocally extinguished as soon as they exist simultaneously to the amount of their respective sums. Compensation takes place only between two debts having equally for their object a sum of money. This is why you got to write the exact sum or a certain quantity of consumable things of one and the same kind and which are equally liquidated and demandable. Compensation takes place whenever, uh, whatever, be the cause of either the debts, except in case first of a demand of restitution of a thing of which the owner has been unjustly deprived, and two, of a demand of restitution of a deposit and a loan for use. All right, right here, a demand of restitution of a deposit and loan for use. That's what you're doing. You're demanding a restitution of that because you're the older new court. You make it a deposit. You're giving them money to use of a debt which has for its cause ailments declared not liable to seizure. Okay, compensation is of three kinds, legal or by operation of law, compensation by way of exception, and by reconvention. Compensation very nearly resembles set off of common law. The principal difference is this, that a set off to have any effect must be pleaded, whereas compensation is effectual without any such plea. Only the balance is a debt. So maybe we should be using the word compensation instead of uh, uh, it's a set off when you go into court, when you do the counterclaim. 
what you're doing is you're getting a compensation. Okay? Write that down. Very important information for you to know. Very important. All right, everybody follow me. I ain't losing anybody. Did I lose anybody thus far? Okay, we talked about what a holder in due course is and what a protected holder is. All right, so I kind of wanted to raise your awareness of the principles that are being utilized. These are principles. You can see this right here, protected holder and holder in due course, they are applying a principle. It's a principle of, uh, of negotiable instruments. They will word it in their own way but they're both utilizing the same principles that are coming out of the law merchant. It will be a good practice to look at both of these and see how, because they're, what they're doing is they're, they're going to a new world order. So they're taking all of the uniform, they're, they're uniforming all the laws domestically, and then they're going to start unifying them internationally. You're going to see this on an international level because you keep hearing them say new world order, how are you going to have a new world order? For there to be a new world order, the law has to be the same all over the planet. <sighs> Am I losing anyone? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a 15-minute break. I got to take a break. When I come back, we're going to finish putting together our international bill of exchange right here and i'll let y'all read that matter of fact let me put this right here for you for if i do that Oops. And I will be back in about 15 minutes. So, all right. Get your questions together, too. All right. Be back in a little bit.
Hello. Hey, uh, I raised my hand because I'm having the trouble on this end hearing your audio. I don't know if anybody else is having the same trouble. I see your screen moving and I see what you're doing, but I don't hear what you're saying. I don't know if anybody else is having that problem. All right, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Boy. We can hear you now. Okay, right, so we I'm haven't heard we haven't heard anything you said since you came back on the break, but we were able to see what uh, I was which, doing. Which you okay. Were doing. So right, if you want to recap on that, and okay, then uh, I'm gonna recap. I'm I apologize. Okay, let me get back. All right. Let me go back all the way back. I'm going to read, talk about everything I just said. Okay, apologize. But I, I know the mic was off. Apologize for that. Apologize, apologize, apologize. Okay. Let's get back up here. To our definitions. Okay, we we have our def. We're in Article 5. We're doing reading Articles 5 right now. All right, so we just got through understanding what a protected holder is. All right, next we're going to talk about a guarantor, okay? H, a guarantor means any person who undertakes an obligation or guarantee under Article 46, whether governed by Paragraph 4B, guaranteed, or Paragraph 4C, aval of Article 47. So right now we're talking about Article 46 and Article 47, okay? So we're going to go over there and look at Article 46 and Article 47 to see what a guarantor is. All right, so here we have the guarantor, Article 46. Payment of an instrument, whether or not it has been accepted, may be guaranteed as to the whole or part of its amount for the account of a party or the draw E, okay? So you're guaranteeing the account you're guaranteeing is for the straw man, obviously, that is represented on the bond, okay? And the draw E, which is the Secretary of Treasury. You can do it for the party or the draw E. The draw E in this case is that you're guaranteeing this for who? The Secretary of Treasury. A guarantee may be getting, this is why you need to know this. So when these people start raising arguments, oh, you're trying to access some secret account, you understand what you're doing. Like, no, I'm, I'm the one guaranteeing you. What are you talking about? It's my credit that is being represented by that bond. I'm not accessing any secret account. You're not accessing a secret account when you do this process. It has nothing to do with a secret account. Hold on for a second. Try to turn the volume down that phone, okay? All right, so you're not accessing a secret account or anything like that, okay? So you're being a guarantor. You're a guarantor, all right? The draw E is the uh, is in this case is really not the Secretary of Treasury. It's your, you know, he's he's the he's the trustee of it. It's coming off of your account that you have set up that you created that you deposited in your bond, okay? So it's a guarantor may be given by the person who may or may not already be a party, okay? You're not a party like in a court case because you're a third party intervener or you come in and intervene or you're not, you know, you say I'm not that person and all that. Just kind of think in, the, in those terms. A guarantee must be written on the instrument or on a slip affixed there too, an allonge, which is an attachment that goes to the instrument. Three, a guarantee is expressed by the words guaranteed, avil, good as avil, or words of similar import, accompanied by the signature of the guarantor. For the purposes of this convention, the words prior endorsement, guaranteed, or words of similar import do not constitute a guarantee. Four, a guarantee may be affected by a signature alone on the front of the instrument. A signature alone on the front of the instrument 
other than that of the maker, the drawer or the draw E is a guarantee. Okay. A guarantee may specify the person for whom he has become the guarantor. In the absence of such specification, the person for whom he has become guarantor is the acceptor or the drawee in the case of a bill and maker in the case of a note. A guarantee may not raise as a, a guarantor may not raise as a defense to his liability the fact that he signed the instrument before it was signed by the person for whom he is a guarantor or while the instrument was incomplete. Let's read that again. These are all your, and, and I want you to understand something. These are all the different circumstances that may arise. This is why you got to read all 96 articles because there's so many different things that can come up in the negotiation of negotiable instruments. They already have a rule that will cover any eventual circumstance that could possibly crop up. Right here, we're going to be on our instrument. We are interested in Article 46, number three. A guarantee is expressed by the words guaranteed, aval, good as aval, or words of similar import accompanied by the signature of the guarantor. For the purposes of this convention, the words prior endorsement, guaranteed, or words of similar import do not constitute a guarantee. So when you look at our negotiable instrument, what I was writing on here, which y'all couldn't hear, is right here where I was putting in pursuant to and in accordance with the final articles of the Uncitral Convention in effect on the date hereof, reference ratified convention articles 1 through 7, which we're reading now, 11, 12, 13, 46, 3, 47, 1, and 53. We're going to go through all these articles because you need to read all of these articles because they apply to your negotiable instrument. So we just got to reading 46.3. Let's go back over and look at 47. The liability of a guarantor on the instrument is of the same nature as that of the party for whom he has become the guarantor, like a cosigner. If the person for whom he has become guarantor is the draw E, okay, which is what you're doing, the guarantor engages to pay the bill at maturity to the holder or to any party who takes up and pays the bill. So you're not going to ultimately at the end of the day, these are negotiable instruments or credit instruments. You're ultimately responsible for the payment of it. You got to understand what you're doing because when these people come at you trying to say that you're drawing off an account of the United States, there isn't any account. They're telling the truth, but we understand that too, because that's how we're constructing our documents. Uh, in the secure party process, you're constructing all of this with the knowledge that there is you're not drawing off of any account from the United States. That's why it's so ridiculous and it just looks so asinine when people get in trouble for this because it is just evidence that they don't know what they're doing. You let these people invade you into a charge. You're not taking anything from them. You're giving them something is what you're doing. And they know that, trust me. B, if the bill is payable at a definite time upon dishonor by non-acceptance and upon any necessary protest, okay, and protest is when they send you something from a third party, to pay it to the holder or to any party who takes up and pays the bill, okay? Three, in respect of defenses that are personal to himself, a guarantor may set up, A, against a holder who is not a protected holder, only those defenses which he may set up under paragraph one, three, and four of article 28, and we'll read that a little later. B, against a protected holder, only those defenses which he may set up under articles one through 30, and these are protected, and these are the 10, 10 real defenses, it's called 10 real defenses, is what they're referencing of a holder in due course, all right? And You'll see that in, let me show you those real quick so you know what I'm talking about.
Okay, wait a minute. Let me just do it like this. Uh... Oops, wrong one, man. I got the wrong one. Uh, where's H? Okay, hold her in due course, all right. And uh you see real defense is right here. Okay, hold her in due course, a person who in good faith has given value for a negotiable instrument, value that is complete and regular on his face, is not overdue. And to the possessor's knowledge has not been dishonored. Under UCC 3-302, Old and Due Course takes the instrument free of all claims and personal defenses, but subject to real defenses, also termed holder in due course. All right, so we have to look at what real defenses are. Oh, it's under number four under defense. I got me jumping all over the place. I am right here, defense, and we're under the we're looking for the fourth sense of the word. It's down here, ostrich defense. Did I pass it? Okay, here it is for right here, commercial law. A basis for avoiding liability on a negotiable instrument. The drawer asserted a real defense against the old and due course. Absolute deep see real defense. Real defense right here. A type of defense that is good against any possible claimant, so that the maker or drawer of a negotiable instrument can raise it even against the holder in due course. The 10 real defenses are one fraud in the factum. That and that's what y'all should study where you've been fooled or invaded into signing something and you weren't told it was a negotiable instrument. Two, forgery of a necessary signature. Three, adjudicated insanity. Everybody in the mortgage industry should be paying attention to this too. Three, because uh, that's what you need. These are your defenses. Three, adjudicated insanity that under state law renders the contract void from its inception. Four, material alteration of the instrument. Five, infancy, which renders the contract voidable under state law. Six, illegality that renders the underlying contract void. Seven, duress. Eight, discharge in bankruptcy or any discharge known to the holder in due course. Nine, a suretyship defense. For example, if the holder knew the one endorser was signing as a surety or accommodation party. And 10, a statute of limitation, generally three years after dishonor or acceptance of a draft and six years after demand or other due note, uh, due date on a note. Also termed absolute defense, universal defense. And you can read about this in Bills and Notes in Corpus Juris Secundi, and you can also read it, Bills and Notes in American Jurisprudence. All right, so these are what's called 10 real defenses that can be used against a holder in due course. Now, why do you need to know that? Because a lot of y'all issue instruments without a notice of your instrument into it and that person taking it becomes the holder in due course. 
And if they come to you in the position of holder in due course, we're here, your defenses against that. And the uh, best illustration I can give of that is when people buy homes in the mortgage industry, because they're giving, they're issuing a, a, a negotiable instrument without a claim and allowing the holder of it to become taking it free of all claims. And he's becoming the older new course. He's coming at back to you with a claim. So you put in a counterclaim and he's be one of these things right here. I hope I'm not losing anybody on that. I hope, I'm, I hope y'all are following along. What time is it? Okay, we got a little time. All right. So uh, now we know what uh, we know what the ten real defenses are. These are real defenses. You need to be right. This is going to be on the test. You need to know what the ten real defenses are. You need to know what a protected holder is. That the protected holder and the holder in due course are exactly the same thing. One is under. The Unicentral Convention, one is under Article 3 of the UCC, that they're using the same principles. Okay, and we're putting all of this on there. You need to know what good as, good as Apple means. It's a guarantor. Uh, you're guaranteed. Why are you guaranteeing it? You're guaranteeing the draw E. Who is the draw E? It would be, for lack of a better word, the Secretary of the Treasury. All right. This is why you're putting as good as Avil by authorized representative, okay? You're not drawing off of any account of the United States. You're drawing off of a, uh, of a value from a bond that the Secretary of Treasury is the holder of. He's holding that negotiable instrument for you and with instructions on how it is to be utilized. The registered mail number that they call an account number is a tracking number so we can track who has it. Where is it at? It has to be tracked. All of these instruments should be tracked. This is why they issue QCIP numbers. In the public, they use QCIP numbers to track negotiable instruments. In the private, you use registered mail numbers to, uh, to track negotiable instruments. You have to track your instrument. You have to set up your own routing convention. These articles on here are referencing the laws that we are reading right now. Okay, and I'm going to read another one. Let's look at number 11 real quick. So I want to get through this. Let's look at article 11. Article 11, a bill may be drawn by the drawer on himself or payable to his order. So right here, number 11, you can draw a bill on yourself. Wow. Well, that's what it says. I'm putting it up here, right? I'm letting them know. And we're gonna put the draw right, uh, the draw E right here in just a second. But I'm setting you up and making you understand why this is on here, okay? So in Article 11, a bill may be drawn by the drawer, which is you, on himself or payable to his order. Y'all know that. How many times have you gone to the bank and you didn't have your ATM card, but you had your checkbook and you wrote a check to yourself? How many times have you done that? Could you write a check to yourself and assign it to someone? I don't see why that would be necessary. Just write the check to them. But is it possible to do? You put your signature on it and you're like, oops, I wrote this check to myself, but I really wanted to write it to this person. So I don't have any more checks. So let me just assign, let me sign the check, endorse it on the back and assign it over to this person over here. How many of y'all have done that? They probably don't do that in the age of all these debit cards. A lot of people, you know, I'm, that's kind of old. That's from the old school. They got y'all in the debit cards right now. So a lot of y'all may not know. Michael Walker, do you have a question? Michael Walker? Oh, shit. No question. 
Okay. I'm trying to get y'all to ask some questions. Atari Tucker L, did you have a question? And not at this exact moment. I was talking about when I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Okay, okay. I apologize for that. Are y'all following along? Is this does this make sense to you? Yes. Okay, all right, cool, cool. All right. All right, let's get back. All right. All right, so we got our instrument. This is what these articles are for on here. When you see these strange numbers on here, they're directing you to articles in that document that lets you know what is being applied to this particular instrument. Okay, let's look at number 12 real quick. 12, completion of an incomplete instrument. An incomplete instrument which satisfies the requirements set out in paragraph one of article one and bears the signature of the drawer or the acceptance of the drawee or which satisfies, notice we're using the word or and or, but the signature of the drawer or the acceptance of the drawee or which satisfies the requirements set out in paragraph two of article one and paragraph two D of article three but which lacks other elements pertaining to one or more of the requirements set out in Article 2 and 3 may be completed and the instrument so completed is effective as a bill or a note. So even if you forget to put something on it, it still can be effective. If such an instrument is completed without authority or otherwise than in accordance with the authority given, A, a party who signed the instrument before the completion may invoke such lack of authority as a defense against a holder who had knowledge of such lack of authority when he became a holder and be a party who signed the instrument after the completion is liable according to the terms of the instrument so completed. These are all your defenses again and why you have to understand when you read this what a holder is, what a protector holder is and what defenses are and why knowledge has to be given, notices have to be given. Everywhere you look in this thing, you're gonna keep seeing them say, well, if I wasn't given notice of that fact, it doesn't affect me. If you don't give somebody notice of something as a principle of law, they can move against you or do whatever. And, and you know, if some, you give somebody an instrument and there's no notice that it got a fraudulent signature on it, they can negotiate it and not be liable for anything. All right, what's the next one we're going to look at? We're going to look at number 12. We just Well, we just read, uh, I think that was Article 12. Let's read Article 13. Article 13, an instrument is transferred, A, by endorsement and delivery of the instrument by the endorser to the endorsee or by mere delivery of the instrument if the last endorsement is in blank. Okay, what is an in blank endorsement? Let's look at that real quick. Okay, blank endorsements. Let's look at it real quick. Blank endorsements. What is a blank endorsement? A blank endorsement is a signature by someone who creates a who creates a financial instrument such as a check. This enables any holder of the instrument to assert a claim for payment. Since no payee is specified, such an uh, such an endorsement essentially turns the instrument into a bearer. All right. Breaking down blank endorsements. The most well-known example of a blank endorsement is a check made payable to cash and endorsed on the back with the signature of the account holder. Blank endorsements are much more risky than paid to endorsements. If the instrument is lost, it can be negotiated cash and deposited by anyone who finds it. Blank endorsements and other forms of check endorsements. In addition to blank endorsements, two other major type of check endorsements exist. These include restrictive endorsement, in which the party writing the check notes for deposit only on the first line of the back of the check and then signs his or her name underneath. This form of a check may be deposited into an account with a specified name. In addition, some banks prefer a check with a restrictive endorsement to have the recipient's account number also spelled out clearly 
on the check. Oh, well, I, I don't have it on here. I'm sorry. I ain't put it on here yet. The recipient of a special endorsement is the only, knows they call it a special endorsement. Special, that word special is always associated with a limited, it, associated with private or with a limited class of people. Okay. It's not, when you see that word special in law, it, you always should let you know, you should always think private. Of a special endorsement, it doesn't mean private, but it references it can reference the private. You look it up in a Black's Law Dictionary, you'll see what I'm saying. Special endorsement is the only person who may cash or deposit this check. Instructions for a special endorsement are as follows. Pay to the order name of the recipient and sign below. That's a special endorsement. Blank endorsements and depositing checks. While most deposits in the bank savings or checking accounts qualify as a transaction deposit, meaning that the funds are immediately available and liquid without delays. It often takes certain checks a full 24 hours to fully clear, although a portion of it could be available for immediate use. One exception to this rule is certificate of deposit, CD, a savings account which restricts withdrawals for a time period, lasting anywhere from 30 days to five years. In general, a depositor of a CD must give notice prior to withdrawing funds before the time limit expires. Fees are often associated for doing so. Okay, and that is that that if you look listen at principle, that's what you have right here. You have days after you can restrict the time when they can get you know their money. This is like this. I look at this kind of like a post dating the check or something like that. But there's some other things you can do with bills of exchange, like make them get their money in a series of transactions. This was you know it's a very versa, ver, uh, versatile instrument. It's an international bill of exchange. OK, so let's get back to the articles. All right, we read 11, 12, 13. We read 46 and 47. Let's look at 53 now. Or did, did we read 14? Did it say 14? No, yeah, yeah I was going to say 53. Fifty-three. If a bill which must be presented for acceptance is not so presented, the drawer, the endorsers, and their guarantors are not liable on the bill. Oh, my God. So if they take your check or your instrument and don't present it, you're not liable. They have to present it. You have to make me liable. To make me liable. That's what Gene Keaton was saying. You heard Gene Keaton. He said that in... Um, uh, what's the characterization 101? He wrote that letter to that lady. That lady, if you're going to make me liable on this instrument, you got to make presentment with it. This is why I told that judge. I heard me on my video. I tell the judge all the time. I say, Yana, he said, it's a, it's a worthless piece of paper. That's your opinion. That's not for us to discuss. He has to make presentment of that instrument, and he can return it to me with evidence of a defect from a qualified third party and allow me an opportunity to cure. Absent that, sir, I consider this matter statement uh, settled and closed. I'm not liable on anything because you ain't made presentment. Failure to present a bill for acceptance does not discharge the guarantor of the draw E of liability on the bill. A bill is considered to be dishonored by non-acceptance if the draw E upon due presentment expressly refuses to accept the bill or acceptance cannot be obtained with reasonable diligence or if the holder cannot obtain the acceptance to which he's entitled under this convention. Okay, if they've taken it to the bank and the bank, he just expressly refuses it. That's when they stamp on it, refuse and so forth, uh, insufficient funds and all that. If presentment for acceptance is dispensed with pursuant to Article 52, okay, unless the bill is in fact accepted. If a bill is dishonored by non-acceptance in accordance with paragraph 1A of this article, if a bill is dishonored by non-acceptance in accordance with article, uh, paragraph 1A of this article, the holder may exercise an immediate right of recourse against the drawer, the endorsers and their guarantors subject to the provisions of article 59. It is if they make, uh, uh, make presentment with it, okay? If they actually present it. All right, so now we're getting to see, and this is, let me tell you, all 96 of these articles are very, very interesting because you see all the different type of situations that can arise 
And that is, and you may want to put some different ones on your particular instrument as you read through these. Is what I'm trying to get you to see is don't just carp and copy what because how I'm giving this to you is how it was given to me by the bank. A banker gave me this. A banker is the one who gave me this. He didn't give it to me in his form, but everything that he gave to me was on here. And he told me to cast it into uh, the form of a check. And I'm going to show you the original form it was in. Probably do that tomorrow. Show you how it originally looked like when he gave it to me. So you can see what I did on the particular instrument. So right here, I wanted y'all to understand when y'all see this verbiage on here, what this verbiage is talking about, what it is referencing. Okay. And it's coming from these articles. And this is why you have to read the articles of it in order to construct the instrument. This instrument is not just constructed just in a happenstance type fashion. It is following, like when I told y'all, I told when the judge offered me this some type of instrument that I said, no, I dragged to my instrument in, in, in strict uh, conformance of the United Nations Conference on International Trade Law and uh, UCC Article 3. You know, I said something like that to him or whatever. But I want y'all to see that the principles involved in this, if you have the necessary elements on the document, it automatically makes it negotiable. You will not see one thing in the articles that talks about routing numbers. Routing numbers is something they made up so they can track the instrument and, and do banking and it and get where it's at. But negotiable instruments do not have to contain routing numbers. But you do have to have something in place for you to be able to form a claim on that instrument and to track that instrument. And that's where QSIP numbers came in. And in the private, we're using registered mail numbers to track your instrument. And also, you have to give a notice of a claim, which is what we're going to do also. We're going to probably do that tomorrow. I'll show you how to put the notice of the claim on there. Okay, but let's keep going. All right. I want everybody. I hope everybody's following along with me and understanding that this is just not something just thrown together. OK, you read what the instructions tell you to do and then you follow along with the instructions. and You put it on there. So we have our as good as Avalon here by authorized representative. This is making you a guarantor. You have next to it over here. You have your address. All right. Next to the drawee signature over here, you got uh, the location, all right? You have the location. This right here to let you know it's international right here. You have United States Treasury, Washington, D.C. That's next to the payees information. You want where they're located and also where you, because, you know, this is an international bill of exchange. There's law between states. So you're coming out of two different jurisdictions. It's always two jurisdictions because you're coming from the private and they're in the public, but you want it to be different states and so forth. So this lets you know, okay, use the International Bill of Exchange because it's in the rules. This is why you're doing this. All right. Let's get back up to Article 6. I think we're just reading Article 5 which has the definitions in it, okay? And we have party, means a person who has signed an instrument as drawer, maker, acceptor, endorser, or guarantor. Maturity means the time of payment referred to in paragraph four, five, six, seven of article nine. And signature means a handwritten signature, it's facsimile or an equivalent authentication. Or Sig uh, signature means uh, that's my brother called me. Okay, signature means a handwriting signature. It's facsimile or an equivalent authentication affected by other means. Forged signature includes a signature by the wrongful use of such means. Money or currency includes a monetary unit of account, which is established by an intergovernmental institution or by agreement between two or more states, provided that this convention shall apply without prejudice to the rules of the intergovernmental institution or to the stipulation of the agreement okay so we have an agreement all right and then we have article six for the purposes of this convention a person is considered to have knowledge of a fact if he has actual knowledge of that fact or could have uh, been aware of its existence all right once again notice and seven okay interpretation of formal requirements 
The sum payable by an instrument is deemed to be a definite sum, although the instrument states that it is to be paid with interest by installments at successive dates, by installments at successive dates with a stipulation in the instrument that upon default and payment of any installment, the unpaid balance becomes due. That's what they put in your promissory notes. Okay, it's a principle. According to a rate of exchange indicated in the instrument or be determined as directed by the instrument or in a currency other than the currency in which the sum is expressed in the instrument. And they have to have this because we're dealing with internet and you're dealing with different type of currencies and different and going across different countries. And that's why they have this in here. Okay, that what a definite sum means. All right, because this, this instrument is being negotiated. So you have that on there as well. Okay, next, who is the draw E? I want don't want to use this. Hold on. Not not this part right here. <sighs> yeah, we went we started saying depository trust company because they were trying to say they were they were trying to say that we were writing it for the uh the Secretary of Treasury. Uh you know, they were misconstruing what we were saying. So I we had to do backwards oops let me step forward sorry All right, uh, and I think I want to do it like, uh, let me see, let me get a little smaller. Well, I, I like to just do this. I like to make my first letter. I try to make it nice. All right. To Ansley Gis, what does Ansley Gis mean? It means a creature of the state. United States Trust 
John Henry Doe, all right? Exempt priority prepaid account number. Now, what a lot of people do, instead of, because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a contract trust, instead of putting like depository trust company, uh, company right here, you could put your UCC contract trust account number and then put your filing number right there. Because what are we doing? Is any of this written in stone? No. Why? Because you can use your own convention. What are you trying to do is the principle. What are we trying to do? You're trying to direct them where to find the credits. Where is the credit? Where is the credit located? The credit is located with it, with the Secretary of Treasury because he is the holder of the bond. All right. Now, the reason people started getting creative is because people start, uh, there was this point around 2010, around I think around 2013, as soon as they seen that the draw E was the United States Treasury, they started accusing people of trying to access a secret account and defrauding the United States government. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? All right, now this is just a misconstruction, of, uh, they misconstruing what it is that you're attempting to do. Now, if they are able to do that, it is only because you have not been clear, concise, and cogent and definite in your instructions as well as in the construction of your instrument to let them know exactly what is going on. Once again, this is why you do the first step of the secure party process when you send that first package off, that constitutes a notice of your status and intent. So what you're doing is, where is the credit coming from? When they look at your UCC filing number, it lets them know who is in possession of the bond. You got a claim on a bond as well as your processing instructions that you have. The bond, the Secretary of Treasury is the trustee who has a fiduciary duty to follow your instructions. When you make presentment, you have to make presentment to him. When you make presentment to him in the form of a letter of credit or something to that effect, a demand for lawful money to be transferred over into your account, the lawful money is coming from the private side. So you want that money to be assigned over to constitute a set off, an offset of an obligation in the public. The credits are coming from the bond. How do you access the bond once they have it in their possession? That is the question. How do you access those credits? Once you do all this secure party process stuff, you send off bonds, you fill, fill out security agreements and you do all of this. Okay, and then you start drafting negotiable instruments. Well, how are you going to access the bond? What instructions are you giving? Are you looking at this instrument? This is an instructional instrument. You can put the bond number on here. Let's do this. Y'all see, see where I'm getting 
you okay once you understand what you're doing you can give if you understand what you're doing you can give clearer instructions credit by assignment through draw uh drawers ucc contract trust account filing number you want you might want to put the state where they can find the filing number bond number okay all right holder secretary of the treasury and then you can put his address there my point is saying is this you want something as clear and as concise to let them know where to find who is the draw e where is this where are these credits coming from where are that that is the question where are these credits coming from and how are we uh, how are you going to instruct me to access those credits okay that is the question that you're answering the only way to properly answer that and, un and understand that you can get creative is when you understand the principles surrounding it, that you're engaged in private banking, that you've set up a private account with the Secretary of Treasury. It's in the private, it's not in the public. You set it up, they didn't set it up. You're not accessing anything they set up. You're accessing something you set up. Are there any questions on this? Let me just pause for a second. Because I, I really want to make sure y'all got the concept down, locked down in your mind. Because that's what's important. That's what's very, very important for you to understand. That I see a lot of people get in trouble. They don't understand. They don't understand the concept behind it. They just write a draft and a negotiable instrument and give it to somebody. Vanessa Walls, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering when you say pay to the order, United States Treasurer, that's just an example? Or would it be like to the... Uh company that we're trying to send it to well the treasury department you you make it uh payable to the united states treasury because the treasury department is the one that's going to apply it on their books all right you're you're assigned uh you're yeah they the this instrument is is a uh let me see how i can put this it's a conduit for credit okay it's like an instruction now some people put to the particular person on there some people put to the particular person on there. Right. Um, I went off of, um, I went to the uh, the IRS website and read a lot of stuff. And a lot of people was putting paid to the order of the United States Treasury and things of that nature. But it doesn't hurt. You, this is, as far, in, a, in accordance with the rules, you can put that, like Dodge, let's say Dodge, Chrysler Corporation or whatever. You can put Chrysler Corporation in there, but you have to specify what's going on long as you this is all about instructions nowhere in here does it tell you how your instrument has to look that's why i'm going to show you documentary drafts and everything you can write this stuff out in the form of a contract and make it a negotiable instrument which is what they do with core contracts okay you can write it out in any form you want long as it is understood exactly what you are doing and how the funds are going to be generated and how the funds are going to be obtained by the part person who's claiming that you owe them something. Did that make sense? I hope I'm I'm not confusing you. I'm trying to because if I'm if I'm confusing you, then it's my fault. It's not your fault. So go ahead. No. Um, one more question. When you do collateralize this at the UCC on a UCC three, correct? A three is an assignment. You're doing an assignment of your credit with a three. Right. You're going to put a UCC three with this, which is what I'm going to show you next is the special instructions that go along with this. There are special instructions that go along with this. I guess I'm getting confused when it comes to if I do make it to the order of whoever, what do they get a copy of this? Do they get the original? Do I do two originals? How does that work? Sending it to the CEO. You can send it to the you can send it to them. You can send this to them, but you got to send something to the Secretary of Treasury too. Right. And what right. would that be? Really, I'm going to tell you how it's supposed to go. You're supposed to send okay. this to them, and you're supposed to put a lawful money of order, which call a uh, a uh, what's called an authorization for credit to the Secretary of Treasury. All right. Okay. I'm going to tell you okay. how it's supposed to go. People start getting creative because of the problems that they came in. So I'm going to give you the way it's supposed to go. It should be paid to the order of Chrysler Corporation. All right. All this right here. Who the draw is going to be is going to be the Secretary of Treasury. You're supposed to give that to them with some uh, with some um, processing instructions. They're going to pay, take that to their bank, to the TTNL department, the Treasury Tax and Loan Department, and there's going to be a teletype that's going to go to the Treasury Department. The uh, uh, 
authorization for credit the Secretary of Treasury should have already received. And once he receives that, he is authorized to place that credit on the books of those individuals because you got to remember there isn't any money. This is all accounting. So what you're instructing your authorization of credit to the Secretary of Treasury is instructing him once he receives, um, for like just like when they go to the bank, when they go to the bank, you know, it's like, okay, you 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 taking a check to the bank. Well, they supposed to take it to the bank. The bank in this case, being the Secretary of Treasury, which is the real bank, all these other banks are intermediaries, or what's right. called middlemen. Okay, they supposed to be taking it there. They can't take it directly there, so they take it to their bank, and their bank will direct a communication to the secretary of treasury once that communication with at the secretary of treasury is received the secretary of treasury who's a fiduciary should have already received an authorization from you and you'll see this all through the irs code that yeah I, he is authorized here's my authorization for the utilization of my credit that's how it's supposed to go so thank you for the question i should guess put out there because sometimes i get stuck in because i i was doing this so much and you know the different people you run into try to act like they don't know what you're doing and all that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. to prevent people from getting arrested okay people start changing things and everything like that not a lot of people have got i've never had anybody get arrested or anything like that neither myself and i didn't issued all kind of these things but the thing is is that you you know people were getting creative with it and i watch court cases with people oh he's trying to draw money from a secret account off from the secretary of treasury and people wasn't understanding that they're going to say it was a secret account no this is this is a negotiable instrument there's a negotiable instrument which is a bond that's being held by someone that has a value and you're giving them instructions to take the value of that bond and assign a portion of it over to this individual because that's all we have in the economy is credit everything is credit there isn't any money everything's credit what do you think these instruments are we think they got these UCC and, and Unicentral Convention and uh, talking about promissory notes, bills of exchange, bonds, and all the checks and all this. All these are credit inst debt instruments. There's no money. So when I do send this authorization to the U.S. Treasurer and send the actual bill of international bill of exchange to the CEO, say, for instance, do I put a disclaimer on the back and also a stamp? You can put a disclaimer on the back. You can do any. Listen, you can do whatever you want to do. Right, right. What, what, what amount of a stamp? Well, there was stamp. Usually, a dollar stamp is pretty good. They got a book called Stamps, uh, right. three cent stamps. Uh, uh, three cent stamps was like uh, they call revenue stamps, revenue stamps. Mm -hmm. And you put a three cent stamp on, on the back of three one cent stamps. Put it on the back. Um, different denominations. People with dollar stamps are good. They're good too. You put that on the back of your stamps go on negotiable instruments don't let them fool you right they go on negotiable instruments okay thank you all right thank you very much hey look y'all i'll tell you what it's two o'clock tomorrow nine o'clock same bad time same bad channel um i want y'all to study this and i'm gonna go over an authorization form tomorrow that we just got through discussing Okay, because I want y'all to start forming in your mind what is going on. Okay, when I you issue these wow. instruments, what is happening? My first, my first thing though is safety, because I don't want y'all to go in out there and I know what you're doing and do something and get arrested and say you Savell told me to do this. I got it on tape. No, I didn't tell you to do that. It's what I'm telling you to do. If you look and see what everything that I'm saying, there's no possible way they could charge you for anything. You're not using routing numbers. You're not accessing some secret account. Okay. You're going back to the old school way of doing things that the colonists did by giving somebody a negotiable instrument and allowing them to present that instrument for payment at a window, at a treasury window. In this case, since we're in the age of no money, the only thing they can receive is credits back on their instrument. Walker Todd said that in his affidavit. He said that you gave credit, they should expect credit back. How, how can you give me credit and then expect labor back? Okay, you have to act like the creditor. You're not giving me, how can you give me credit and you bankrupt? Tell me this, what situation where a bankrupt is gonna give credit to a creditor? Somebody please let me know in the realm of reason how that can happen. Hi. 
anyone. It just defies common sense to think that a bank or the United States or anybody can give you any damn thing. They can't give you nothing. They in bankruptcy. And if you learn these procedures and everything, when you engage them and you know the rules, they won't make you look like a fool. And I'm not talking specifically to you. I'm talking to everybody, okay? <laughs> talking to everybody right now. All right, y'all. Is there any other questions? Anybody got a question? Jay, uh, uh, Andrew, Jay, do you have a question? Anybody have a question? Real quick, you can put some instructions at the bottom. This is something that I uh, that I like to put on my instruments. I found this in a uh, a long time ago, like in 2007, something like that, 2006. And when people were having a lot of success back then, people used to have more success back then than they do now. But so present. This instrument And this right here is going to be your second verbiage. So when you have this on here, you no longer need this. All right. I'm going to show you what I mean. And what I would do is I would put this where your routing numbers go. I put that down there. All right. And let them know how it's supposed to be routed because this is where the routing information goes. You can put your routing information 
down here present this present this international bill of exchange directly to the collecting party with documents acceptance for honor to credit upon site legal tender for debts public charges taxes dues payable without deductions for and free uh for and free of any levy duties i think i made a typo there and free of any levy of any levy duties or imposed of any nature that's because it's private in usd payable to order or to bearer and i don't have payable to order or bearer on here up here because i'm tired that's something else but you take that off so present this international here's your instructions present this international bill of exchange directly to the collecting party with documents the documents is the key that come along with this which is going to be a ucc3 has to be attached to this at all times acceptance for honor whenever it gets negotiated the ucc3 has to be attached to it that's why you're putting all of this on here the documents and in your special instructions that's what's going to be on there as well up on site legal tender for debts public charges due without without deductions and free of any levy duties or imposed of any nature okay these are your instructions you can make better ones than me okay i'm not saying these are the best instructions and everything i actually got this from someone all right but you can modify it you can modify it to your liking but it is essentially correct because that's what I was like. Wow, this is a, this is somebody else that knows exactly what's going on. All right, it gave me a good idea. Instead of putting routing numbers, people put routing numbers down here. Okay, when you do this right here, it lets them know without any question. Okay, there's no routing numbers on this instrument. All right, you don't even leave, leave that available to them. Even try to even surreptitiously put any routing numbers on it or anything like that. This is the routing information right here, how you want them to route the instrument. I usually I have another one that says directly to your TTNL department. I don't think this is the original instructions that I use. I think somebody else put this right here. But I said present directly to the collecting party to the TTNL department of the uh, payees uh, financial institution with documents. Acceptance for honor to credit upon site, legal tender for debts, public charges, taxes, dues payable without deductions and free of lev and free of any levy. Duties are imposed of any nature in USD. All right. This is what we're doing. It, it's in United States denomination, is what we're doing. All right. So this is this is we're talking about credit. These are credit instruments. And they have to be routed a certain way. That's what this course is all about right now. We're, we're discussing how to construct the instrument and how to route the instrument. Those are the two things that you have to be knowledgeable of. How do I construct it? And then how do I route it? How do I, how do I access that bond that is being held by the Treasury Department and direct him to apply credits on that bond over to another payee, to a payee? to satisfy an obligation. Okay, y'all, I hope that was, um, I hope I tried to be as uh, as clear as I can on this. I hope I explained it in a way that didn't confuse you. Um, if I did, you know, please let me know. I'm gonna put a little thing up where y'all can start critiquing the classes as well. I would appreciate feedback on that as well and let me know where I need to make improvements in my presentation. Uh, and so forth. Uh, really would appreciate that. Okay. And that's it for right now. I'm going to leave this in your Dropbox. Okay. It's as you already know, it already has, you see over here on the right, all these are layers. These are called layers. So anything on this thing can be manipulated. I would encourage you to do it yourself. Now, the only reason I use this background, because when I do go and buy check stock, I can just simply eliminate the background print and get the check stock and print it out and it'll print directly onto the check perfectly. That's why I do that. All right. Put the check stock on there. All right. That, that's used as my guide. So I can guide it. And then when I get through with it, I just get rid of the layer 
and then put it in the printer and print it out and it prints directly onto the check stock perfectly. Ron Mason, you have a question? Yes, sir. All right, go ahead. I don't have a question for you. My hand is not up. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, all right. All right, y'all, that's it. I will see y'all tomorrow at 9 p.m. Once again, all you got to do is log in. Um, every, all, everything will be in the back in the back office once again for your access to tomorrow's webinar. All right, peace to the gods. Hope you enjoyed that. Look forward to your feedback. Thank you, and y'all have a wonderful Saturday afternoon. Peace.